What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another Megami Tensei challenge, and yeah, I know, it's still not the Persona 3 Reload video. Don't worry, it's coming, it's just, that game is ridiculously long, and right now I'm in a spot where I need to pump out videos consistently. But for those of you that are still here, we are going to be playing Shin Megami Tensei 2 without demons. You all seem to enjoy my last two videos where I went back and did demonless challenges for old school Mega Ten games, especially SMT1, so it only seems appropriate that I do the same thing for Shin Megami Tensei 2. Unfortunately, unlike SMT1 where there are several translations across its many different versions, including a delisted official one for iOS, Shin Megami Tensei 2 hasn't been so lucky. Currently, the only English translation is the almost 20-year-old Aeon Genesis translation for the Super Famicom. I was kind of hoping that at some point it would get a translation for maybe the PS1 version, but from what I've read, the mainline games on that have really bad spaghetti code, so I don't think we'll be seeing one anytime soon. I should mention, though, that there is a patch for the Aeon Genesis translation that updates some of the terminology to be more in line with modern Megaton, and I am going to be playing with this patch. Either way, Shin Megami Tensei 2 is a great game, and I'm really excited to be able to play it again for this challenge. But, before we go any further, let's have a word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Unicorn Overlord. Unicorn Overlord is the newest game from the critically acclaimed developer Vanillaware, who some of you may know as the developers of Dragon's Crown, Odin Sphere, and 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim, and many more. Vanillaware has shown that they're some of the most talented developers in the industry, and now they're treating us to a nostalgic adventure that sends the player on an epic journey with SRPG gameplay where they'll create alliances and rivalries, liberate kingdoms, and explore an expansive fantasy world that you'll be pouring dozens of hours into. Not only that, but it features some beautiful 2D style visuals and an amazing orchestral soundtrack. If you want a taste of what you'll be treated to in this game, Right now, you can download and play the demo, and your progress will carry over into the full game, which launches on March 8th for Nintendo Switch, Xbox Series X, and PS5, along with a digital-only version for PS4. I'll have a link down below in the description. Pre-order now, and don't miss Vanillaware's next masterpiece. Okay, so we get our opening cinematic that explains what's been going on in the several decades since SMT1. Humanity was struggling to survive, so the believers of the Messiah faith got together and built the utopian city of Tokyo Millennium. And that's where this game takes place. It really gives this game a theme that's unique from the rest of the series. Most Megaton games have this realistic modern or post-apocalyptic setting, but here, humanity has recovered from the cataclysm and rebuilt itself into a dystopian future. We start the game and we're immediately woken up by some guy named Okamoto. That's right, we're just thrown right into the game. No weird dream sequences, no name entry screens, none of that. The game has already assigned the name Hawk to me, and Okamoto apparently rescued me from a demon, and is now helping get me prepared for some kind of fighting match that will make us champion if I win. And we'll get invited to live in the Millennium Center, where all the privileged rich believers live in peace. But anyway, before we can leave the gym, we have to go through the virtual battler and gain at least one level, which is really easy. And since Hawk can't use magic, I'm going to be going for a strength and agility focus build here as usual. The gameplay of this game is pretty much a carbon copy of the first game with a few balancing tweaks here and there. The biggest difference though is that we're now playing on a not as advanced system, so it doesn't look or sound quite as good. Once we're out, the first thing we have to do is head next door to the public virtual battler, where we run into Steven, who gives us the demon summoning program. And then, we have to go around to trigger events where we name this game's major characters, and you can name nearly all of them. For the first one, you have to go into this inconspicuous empty room to name this game's law hero, one of my favorite characters in the series, who I was going to name Jonathan, but I didn't have enough room, so I just named him Johnny for short. The next one is at the fortune teller's place, and here you'll name this game's heroine, Hiriko. I want to name her Nemissa, but again, I don't have enough room, so I just make it Nemissa with one S. Next, I have to head over to the other gym in the middle of town and use the virtual battler there to name the next character, Gimel, but I give him the name Isamu. That's all we need to do today, so I just head back to the gym, rest up, and now we can head to the Coliseum to participate in the tournament finals. Now. Before you fight for the championship, there's this little mini dungeon with equipment scattered around along with demons. The rules of this challenge prevent me from using demons, but even during a normal playthrough, 
you can recruit demons here, but you're unlikely to succeed since they'll probably ask for items you don't have. Right now, it's best to just defeat them for experience while going around getting all of the equipment upgrades. Once that's done, I challenge the Red Bear, but not before getting another flashback where I have to name another one of this game's characters. The one I'm naming here is sort of like this game's chaos hero, so I name him Walter, and after that, I have to fight the boss, who is pretty easy. I mean, it's a one-on-one -on -one boss battle, so it's really just a test to see whether or not I grind it enough and have good enough equipment. And I do. My normal attack is doing at least 10 and hitting twice thanks to my new weapon, while his attacks are only doing 9, and because he barely has any HP, he goes down in just 3 turns. Oh, just one more win and you'd have been champion? Well, you're not, because you're a loser. You're a loser. Are you feeling sorry for yourself? Well, you should be, because you are dirt. You make me sick, you big baby. This baby want a bottle. A big dirt bottle. So, while Okamoto and I are celebrating, a woman from the center, one of the characters I just named, Hiroko, shows up. There was an explosion in the center six months ago, and during it, a little boy vanished, along with the two scientists that triggered it. She thinks that one of them is hiding in the mansion of Madame, the leader of Valhalla, which is where we are right now. And since it's customary for champions to be invited there after they win, she tags along. And now, we have our second party member, and one that can use magic. So we go to the mansion, and right before we meet her, we have another name entry screen. This character is Beth, who is kind of like a secondary law heroine for this game, so I name her Amane. So, Madame gives us a bit of backstory on this game. She talks about how the center is a more secured yet controlled area where people live in peace, while Valhalla is more of a free city where people can indulge in earthly pleasures, and that's how she likes it and intends to keep it. It also turns out the scientist that Hiroko was looking for ran off and is going to open a portal to the abyss, and she wants us to capture him and bring him back. She lets us borrow Cerberus, who, much like in SMT1, is basically a temporary crutch who carries us through this next part of the game, but because he's a demon, I can't use him. So, we head across the bridge to the slums, and while exploring here, Cerberus will tell you which direction you're supposed to go, but you don't actually have to follow his directions. In fact, I do recommend you do some exploring so that you can get the treasures that are laying around. Once we do find Hinata, he tries to open the portal to the abyss, and Mercurius comes out and attacks us, but not before killing him. So, Mercurius is our first demon boss, and he's pretty easy, even without servers. Hiroko was already considerably higher level than Hawk when she joined, and her normal attack is doing 4 to 6 damage with each hit, but it's hitting 4 times. Meanwhile, Hawks is doing 7 to 8, but it hits twice. Hiroko does have Zeo, but after seeing how little it does, I decide to just keep attacking. Mercurius goes for Dakunda on the first turn, which is completely pointless. Then he goes for Feral Claw, which doesn't do a lot to either of us, and then he spends the rest of the battle going for Zahn, which does almost nothing, and after a few turns of exchanging blows, Mercurius is defeated. So we head back to report to Madame, Cerberus leaves the party, but someone else is also here, another character that we named in one of those flashbacks, Zane, and he reminds us that I am a citizen of the center, and my name isn't actually Hawk, it's Aleph, but I just name myself Nyarly as usual. So he takes us back to the center, and there, the bishop gives us a little more backstory. Mikata erased my memory so that I not only forget my name, but also forget that I'm the messiah. They take away Hiroko, but she gets replaced by, as the bishop puts it, a partner fitting for the messiah, Beth, that same law heroine that I named earlier. And then, he gives us our first messianic task. Eliminate the Basilisk and King Frost that have taken over the Holy Town District. So we get there, and the random encounters are starting to get a little tougher, but they're still not too much of a problem. Beth is even higher level than Hiroko, but other than that, she's pretty much identical. Her stats and even her moveset are completely the same as Hiroko. Now, the Basilisk isn't encountered like a normal boss. Whenever you go into a tight space between two buildings, you're pretty much guaranteed to encounter the Basilisk. 
Most of the time, he'll either just run away from you or poison your party and then run away. So you just have to keep encountering him until he actually decides that he wants to fight. And from here, it's not really all that easy. The Basilisk specializes in inflicting ailments, particularly poison, and any party member that's poisoned has their damage cut by about three quarters. But this isn't even the worst of it, because his other two moves inflict either stone or paralyze. Both of these completely immobilize the target. They don't wear off on their own, and I don't have anything that can cure them. So if this happens to either of my party members, it's pretty much an automatic reset. His normal attack is also decently strong, doing about 15 damage per hit, which may not seem like a lot, but healing moves in this game aren't very strong at this early point in the game, so the majority of Beth's turns are spent using either Dia or Media. Aleph is doing pretty much the same amount of damage he was to the last boss, although now, instead of a guaranteed two hits, his attack can hit one to three times because I'm now using the Jet Bola, which I got from a Pyrojack in the slums. But yeah, it does take a couple of tries due to the abundance of ailment moves, but with a lot of luck, I am able to take him out. Alright, so that's one boss down. Now the next one is in the Great Church across the bridge, and you don't have to do a lot of dungeon crawling to find him. Now, King Frost is much easier, mainly because he doesn't have any ailment moves. In fact, with the exception of Dekaja, all of his moves are ice type. Now, these moves do have a good chance to freeze, but Aleph and Beth always move first, so it doesn't even matter because freeze wears off after one turn. This also means I could try to stunlock him with Beth's Zionga, but Zionga in this game doesn't have as high a chance to shock as it did in SMT1. His attacks are a bit stronger, dealing damage in the mid-20s, but I'll gladly take that over moves that poison, paralyze, and petrify and King Frost goes down without a hitch. Once King Frost has been defeated, the snowy effect will disappear. Now, you don't have to do anything else here, but I do recommend going upstairs to collect some treasures, especially the metal card, which will be very helpful in just a moment. But don't try to go too far, otherwise you'll be stopped by these stalkers blocking the way. So, I go back to report to the bishop, and it looks like another emergency has popped up. The demon Beetlejuice has taken over the mine there, and the demi Nandis there are running wild. So we take the tunnel to get there, and once there I notice that the random encounters are starting to get a little difficult. But it won't be that way for long. In the township section of the area you can play Codebreaker, a mini game where you have to guess a number, and how many attempts it takes determines your prize. You need to spend metal cards to play, which is why I was stressing that metal card's importance earlier. Because the second place prize for this codebreaker is the Magma Spear. A weapon with a base power of 111 that hits two times. That is significantly more powerful than any weapon I'll be able to use for quite a while. And now, even the toughest random encounters are dropping like flies. Now, to stop the demi Nandis, you have to go to this farm area where you just have to defeat one of these things, and yeah, that's it. The demi Nandis are calmed down, which leaves only Beetlejuice in the mine. And down here, the craziest thing happens. Right outside the room where you fight Beetlejuice, there's a magic chest. These are chests that contain gemstones that can only be opened during a full moon. However, when you open one, there is a 1 in 128 chance that Alice will appear and try to take it. And that's exactly what happens. Now, you could give it to her and she'll disappear, but if you don't, you have to fight her. Now, as to be expected from a fiend, this is going to be a difficult fight. In fact, it's the first boss I've encountered that uses the big boss battle theme in this game. Alice is very strong. Her favorite attack is Death Touch, which deals around 60 to 70 damage and heals her a little bit. That's bad, but conversely, I'm also able to do a lot of damage to her because I just got the Magma Sphere. Around 40 damage with each hit, to be exact, and over 130 with a critical. Unfortunately, after I fail to heal Beth with a bead, she gets taken out, but I'm still going to see if I can do this. After this, she attacks a left for a little over half of his HP. I stall by healing with a bead, then she wastes a turn by going into a battle stance. I then get a lucky critical hit, and it puts her in the red. Rather than heal, I decide to risk it by attacking, and it takes her out. 
but not only does Alice get defeated, but I get the Shiki Staff, a weapon that has a 1 in 256 chance to drop from her. All the fiends in this game have a 1 in 256 chance to drop unique weapons, but these are some of the strongest weapons in the game, and this is no exception. It has a base power of 240, can hit up to 3 times, and can inflict the happy ailment. I also gain 5 levels, which is great, but yeah, the Shiki Staff is only usable by female characters, so I revive Beth and equip it to her, and yeah, I think Beetlejuice will be a good dummy to test this weapon on. Yeah, I get the feeling this little stroke of luck is going to make this game a lot easier. So I go back to the control room again to report to the bishop, but he's not there. Zane is though, and he tells me to check out Arcadia, a prototype area of the Thousand Year Kingdom. There's not much to do here, no bosses or random encounters or anything. All we have to do is follow this hidden pathway to Gimmel's temple, where he informs us that Arcadia has been a success. So once again we go back to report, and the bishop is back, but things aren't going too well. Demons have broken into the center. In fact, you might have encountered some on the way to the center's main building. But on top of that, some guy called the Anti-Messiah has shown up and is trying to mislead everyone. So we go back to Valhalla, and what do you know, he's Dalith, that chaos hero that we named. And he's waiting to challenge us at the Colosseum. There's no point in exploring the Colosseum since the layout and chests haven't changed. But before you go to the main area, make sure you unequip everything off of Beth, because, well, you're about to find out. So we go into the arena, and I have to fight him. I attack him, and he goes down in a single hit. But wait, he's not done yet, so I go into the second phase, where he also goes down in one hit. There's a scripted segment where he gets me down to 50 HP and then goes for the kill, but Beth jumps in the way, and then he goes down in one hit. Once defeated, we have the option to kill him, which I choose not to, a decision that Beth respects, and then she dies. So Dalith runs off, we get praise from the bishop and the crowd, and as soon as we step outside, some kid gives us a note from Mikata, who wants us to meet him in the slums. So we go and find out Mikata is that guy with the cane we saw in the flashbacks. He says he can explain everything, but first we have to rescue Hiroko and bring her back. She's being held in the factory prison deep beneath the center, so we take the previously blocked pathway, where we run into Dalith again, so I just auto-battle him and he goes down in two hits this time. I keep exploring, and while the dungeons are getting a little more complicated, the random encounters are still hardly posing a threat, even with me being by myself. Anyway, in the southern edge of the dungeon we meet Naja, who automatically joins the party. With her we can open the gate to the factory labor camp, and right outside Hiroko's cell we meet Zane. He doesn't support our plan to free Hiroko because he's still loyal to the center, and she's imprisoned for going AWOL, and now he has to be fought as a boss. And he's a complete joke. I mean, it's another one-on-one -on -one fight. His attack deals around 30 to 40 damage and hits twice, but mine deals over double that, and also hits twice, and after three turns of exchanging blows, he goes down. This makes Zane become a little disillusioned with the center, and he starts to realize that maybe not everything they do is justified. This is why Zane is one of my favorite characters in this series, probably my favorite law hero. He's a strong, lawful figure, but he's not blindly loyal to authority. He is capable of recognizing fault in the center system. But anyway, I go into Hiroko's cell to free her, but she isn't in her right mind, and she tells me to leave. What I need to do is go in with Naja in my party, and then force her out. Naja then asks if she's my girlfriend, to which I reply yes, and then she gets angry and calls me a big fat liar a bunch of times. Then, okay, things are 
starting to get a little weird. Whatever the case, Naja merges with Hiroko, and this brings her back to her senses and increases all of her stats by one. She then comes back to the party, but she hasn't gained a single level since she left. And to make matters worse, I can't equip the Shiki staff on her because law-aligned members can't equip it. And I'm law-aligned because I made the decision not to kill Dalit. And Hiroko is always the same alignment that Aleph is. Okay, so... Let me fix this real quick, just grind for a bit in this spot, keep healing at the guy in temple, and there we go. Back to neutral. Okay, now we are back in business. At least that's what I think, until on my way back to Valhalla, I see that the whole place has been swallowed by a bad end because the center no longer had any use for it. That's going to make meeting Mikata a little more difficult, but at least Cerberus is offering to join. I mean, I can't fight with him, but he can still be fusion fodder for sword fusion. This makes Zane go from disillusioned into a full-on rebel, and you can see him rallying up people against the center on the TVs and on the streets of Holy Town. While he's doing that, we now need to go to the Great Church. On the bottom level, there's a guy you could donate money to to get some points toward Law, which I do for reasons you'll soon see, but upstairs you'll see that the path that was previously blocked by the Stalkers is now open. Behind here we meet... <sighs> How many times do I have to teach you this lesson, old man? At least he takes more than two turns to take out. So he runs off again. Beth, why did you have to talk me out of killing him? Okay, so behind here is an elevator that takes you down 60 floors, and it leads to the ruined underworld of Tokyo. The first place we go to is Shinjuku, which has been taken over by fairies led by Oberon. Although, not long after entering, we see Dalith, again, and he summons a fairy named Puck, who tries to spray me with some sap that makes whoever gets affected fall in love with the first person they see. But Hiroko pushes me out of the way and leaves the party to chase after him, and I do not like where this is going. So we meet a fairy named Anoon, and she says to reverse the effect we need to talk to Oberon, and Oberon offers to help if we bring back some sap of our own and we have to get some from Puck. Just go to this little house to the east, and then you'll have to chase Puck through a mini dungeon. As you advance, you'll keep encountering Puck, who will ask you to stop chasing him, and whatever you do, don't say yes, because if you do, you'll have to start all over again. Every time you run into him and say no, he'll either damage you or cast a random ailment on you, so make sure you bring plenty of ailment healing items or other demons that can heal ailments as well. Now, at the end, you may be expecting to fight him, but no. Once you have him cornered, he'll offer to sell you the sap for 10,000 Maka, which you can do for law points, or you can make him just give it to you for neutral points, or you can do that and mug him for 10,000 Maka for chaos points. I'm already law-aligned and I want to stay that way, but I also don't want to pay him, so I just make him give it to me. I take it back to Oberon, and he breaks the spell. We then go to where Dalith was awkwardly trying to avoid Hiroko, and yeah, that's about what I was expecting. Then, Anoon uses the sap on him and... Oh no, I, I think I've seen enough here, I'm gonna get out as fast as possible. Okay, now that we've safely made it through Shinjuku, we can go to Ropangi, a village inhabited by mutants. But before we do anything here, there is a very important piece of equipment I need to get from the first basement level, the Spirit Sword. This sword is what will allow me to use sword fusion to create what is arguably the best weapon in the game. I say arguably because in SMT2, there's a lot of variation with how many times weapons hit. Like, for example, the weapon with the most potential damage is the Oki Staff with a base power of 255, and it can hit up to seven times, but it also has the potential to hit zero times. You kinda have to find the right balance between power and number of hits, and in my opinion, this is the weapon that's the best of both worlds, and it's actually pretty easy to get to. And the Spirit Sword is the first key to getting it. You just fuse the Spirit Sword with Saparna to get the Kogetsune Maru, then fuse the Kogetsune Maru with any Wilder to get the Fujinkin, then fuse the Fujinkin with any Jockey to get the Soul Blade. This weapon has 148 base power and hits 5 to 7 times. I'll let you do the math, but that's a lot of consistent damage. And with it, I am easily able to take out entire waves of enemies with just a single swing. The only catch is that I have to be law-aligned to equip it, which is why I donated money to the church earlier. 
Now, moving on with the story, in the back of the mutant village, we meet a mutant named Hiroko. He explains that Masakado was split into pieces when Tokyo was attacked by demons and missiles, and wants us to find his pieces so he can revive him. So, this next part is just a series of fetch quests, with varying degrees of difficulty and tedium. The first piece I get is from Saru to Hiko's shrine, and I don't have to go through a dungeon or anything, I just go in and fight him as a boss. And given that I have two of the best weapons in the game, and we're only about halfway through, you could probably get an idea of how this is going to go. I lead off with a left swinging and get 7 hits for around 70 damage each. He goes for Takaja and it does absolutely nothing. Hiroko then attacks and only gets 1 hit for 150 damage, but it inflicts the happy ailment on him. A left then attacks for 6 hits, including a critical, and then he loses a turn due to the happy ailment, and then Hiroko finishes him off. The next shrine is a mini dungeon with some teleporters. Nothing too difficult, and at the end I meet Sukuna Hikona, who gives me a piece of Masakado after helping him get out. Then I get another dungeon which is a similar deal, only this time the demon I need to help is Oyamatsumi. After that, there's a mini conveyor belt dungeon, and at the end I have to fight Baphomet, who looks a lot different from how he does in the rest of the series. And he doesn't last a single turn. For the next one, I have to do things a little differently. You may have noticed that one of the stalkers in the Great Church found a head. Yeah, that's Masakado's head. He'll sell it to you for 20,000 Mako, which you can buy at this price for law points, or you can haggle him down to 10,000 for neutral points, or mug it off of him for chaos points. I choose to haggle it off of him. And then the last one is at the eastern corner of the upper section of the underworld. And here, you have to revive Kotoshiro Nushi by using a disc stone on him, and then he'll give you the torso. Okay, so that's all the pieces. I go to speak to Hiroko, and then he asks me to fuse them together at the cathedral, which I have to leave the area to do because out of all the amenities that Roppongi has, the Cathedral of Shadows isn't one of them. So I do that, come back with Masakado, and then Hiroko restores the last part of Masakado, his soul which he had been guarding. With Masakado restored, next we have to go to the sealed cave, which Masakado opens the entrance to. Hiroko then asks me to free the Amatsukami that are imprisoned there, and I'm just like, nah, because I think we've killed enough time, so let's see how Zane is doing. Zane now plans to go to the factory to free the workers that are imprisoned there. We get to the prison through a secret entrance through the mine, but here, the workers don't want to leave. Zane believes it has something to do with the watchtower in the middle of the factory, so that's our next destination. Although, get this, in order to get into the tower, our intelligence has to be at least 10. Yeah, in order to enter a mandatory area, you have to invest points into a mostly useless stat on the protagonist. Well, fortunately, there is a workaround. My intelligence is already at 7, so by going to the bar and drinking some Intelligry, we can temporarily increase our intelligence stat to 10 and get inside. Now, this dungeon isn't anything special, it's just a series of mazes until we reach the boss, but the enemies here are a considerable step up in difficulty from previous areas, but still pretty easy due to how powerful our weapons are. At the top floor, we find an injured Zane who warns us of a demon being used to guard the watchtower. That demon is Belphegor, and he's about as much of a joke as his design. On the first turn, I get a solid 5 hits for 70-ish damage with a left, while Hiroko gets 2 hits for around 130, and he gets inflicted with Happy, and then he goes for a weak attack. The next turn, pretty much the same thing happens, only he loses his turn due to the ailment. The turn after that, a left gets 6 hits, then Hiroko attacks and finishes him off. Okay, so with him gone, we can go through the door that he was sealing, and here we see a siren singing in a sorrowful voice. This siren song is what they've been using to brainwash all the workers, so in order to save her, we need to make a trip to the Abyss and bring back a guy named Peterson. We get to the Abyss the same way Hanada opened up that portal, but the main difference is we need a different doll. The sleeping doll which we get from a guy in the Great Church. With that, we go to the altar there and place all the dolls in the same order that Hanada did, 
only instead of the dancing doll, we place the sleeping doll there. And voila, we are here. So we find Peterson right below the portal we came from, but before going back, there is one other thing to do here. East of the entrance, there is this weird X-shaped portal that takes us to a strange building where people are hooked up to some kind of virtual reality program. Yeah, turns out that Arcadia place was just a virtual reality world. And this is where all the people are being held. This part of the game is optional, but I recommend going here because there are five luck instances and a boss that provides a lot of EXP. And that boss is Gimmel. Okay, so I was expecting this to be an easy fight like the last several bosses, and it would be if not for the fact that his scan skill has a high chance to paralyze two targets, and the first time he uses it, it does exactly that on both Hiroko and Aleph. So, yeah, nothing we can do. I don't know why the game doesn't just send us straight to the game over screen. So yeah, just another cheap luck boss. In my second attempt, I start off dealing damage as usual, and seeing as how Hiroko usually moves before him, I try to see if I can use Zionga to stunlock him, but this doesn't work, and it only deals 9 damage. However, the next turn, I attack with both of them again, get the max number of hits, and he becomes happy and can't move because of it. So, I just follow it up with another attack, and it only takes one hit from here to bring him down. Now, here you can get another big alignment changing decision. You can destroy the network for chaos points, or you can make yourself the new administrator for law points. I choose to make myself the administrator, and then head back to the factory watchtower to reunite Peterson with the siren. The siren stops playing her song, and together they head back to the abyss. So if you check the TV now, the center is fed up with Zane, and they threaten to cut off Holy Town's air supply if Zane doesn't turn himself in. Zane takes this as an opportunity to launch a counterattack against the center, so we go there to help him do just that. The bishop in the control center gives us the code to get to the back area so that the elders can speak to us, and yeah, this is overall another pretty short and easy dungeon. Just before we confront the elders, we run into one of them that doesn't agree with what the rest of them are doing, and after that, we meet the wall from the beginning of SMT1, who asks us some moral alignment shifting questions. I just answer honestly, and this points my alignment more toward law. And right outside the Elder's room, we find Zane turned to stone. That's unfortunate, but we still have a task to do. Inside, the Elders reveal who they truly are. The Archangels. And first, we have to fight Uriel and Raphael at the same time. Now, these guys are about equal in power, so it doesn't really matter which one you take out first. I decide to focus on Raphael though, and to him, Aleph is doing around 70 to 80 damage with his 5 to 7 hits, while Hiroko is doing around 150 with her 1 to 3 hits. They alternate between their abysmally weak magic attacks and their moderately strong physical attacks. Out of the two, Raphael is dealing the most damage, and they get Hiroko down pretty low. When this happens, I try to have her heal herself with Dia Rahan, but they move before her and manage to take her out before she can do that. So, I revive her with a Kenton, and this same turn, Hiroko attacks and takes out Raphael. And from here, it gets much easier. Against Uriel, I'm doing a bit less than I was to Raphael, but the strategy is the same. Just keep swinging at him while he swings at me, and a few turns later, he bites the dust. Immediately after, we have to fight the Red Elder, who is predictably Michael. And this boss is much easier than the last two, because while he's stronger than them, there's only one of him. To him, I'm doing about the same amount I was to Uriel, and the strategy is also the same. Just keep swinging at him until he goes down. His attacks are hardly doing anything, and really, the only cause for concern is the fact that he can heal with Diorama, but it's still healing him nowhere near as much as I'm able to deal to him every turn. Oh, and midway in, I inflict the happy ailment on him. It's not like it makes a difference, but yeah, pretty easy fight overall. But get this, we're still not done yet. There is one more boss, and that boss is... God himself. Kinda. Even if you haven't played this game, you probably know about Yahweh's appearance through memes and other stuff. I mean, SMT2 is one of the games that started the whole God as the final boss in JRPGs trope, but you might notice that something seems a little 
off. Well, off or not, Patrick Stewart's disembodied head is looking right at us and we have to fight it. This Yahweh's defenses are considerably higher than any of those Archangels. Aleph's attacks are only doing about 50 damage with each hit, and they seem to be missing a lot more too, while Hiroko's attacks are now doing around 100. His magic attacks are still weak, but his physical attack hits like a truck, dealing well over 100 damage to Hiroko, and it's one of those attacks that can hit multiple targets multiple times. It's not long before Hiroko gets taken out again, so I try to revive her with a Kintan, and it fails, so I have to use another one, but after that, he doesn't seem to want to go for his physical attack anymore, and just spams magic attacks. I decide to start using Hiroko to heal with Medea, and seeing as how he's now favoring magic attacks, I should be able to heal most of his damage off with this skill. And given how much HP this boss has, well, I decide to try my hand at auto battle, but this backfires and he takes out Hiroko and almost takes out a left. So I use a B to heal a left back up, then use my last Kintan on Hiroko, which causes her to automatically attack, and with just barely any HP left, Hiroko takes out Yahweh. So yeah, we just defeated three of the four center elders, and God, but what about that other guy? Well, that one reveals himself to be Gabriel. It turns out, big shocker, that Millennium was nothing more than a means to enslave humanity. They needed a savior to lead the people, but that savior never came, so they created one of their own. But this meant straying further from God's path, and that's why Gabriel sided with Zane. And speaking of, Zane is now back to normal, but it looks like there's trouble in Holy Town. So I go to the great church, and then... That does not look good. That thing that's drilling through the ground is apparently the tail of a giant demon that's likely coming from the Abyss. So we need to go to the Abyss, but the doll method doesn't work anymore, but there is another way, and that's by gathering the seven pillars. Yeah, you might have noticed those pillars that you got from a couple of mandatory quests. In fact, some of them you might have also gotten without even realizing it. Right now, I've got all of them except for the Jupiter pillar, the Venus pillar, and the Moon pillar. The Jupiter Pillar you get from the same spot you fought Beetlejuice at, while the Venus Pillar you get from the Mutant Elder in Ropongi. You can talk to him at any point after you reach Ropongi, but he won't give you the Pillar until after that Drill Tail thing appears in Holy Town. The last one, the Moon Pillar, is gotten through what is probably the stupidest mandatory thing a mainline game has ever had a player do. You have to win a dance contest. That's right, you have to go to one of those disco clubs where every single time you turn or move you have to scroll through the slow moving dialogue, then, and you can only do this on a full moon mind you, you have to enter the dance contest and only by winning first place do you get the moon pillar. And how do you win the dance contest? By having your magic stat be higher than 10. That's right, it's not your agility or your luck or your endurance or anything like that, it's your magic that determines your ability to dance. If you've been wondering why I've been putting points into magic despite a left being unable to use any, this is why. And here, you can't even go to the bar to drink to boost your magic, because as soon as the moon hits full, it wears off. Though, as ridiculous as this whole scenario is, I have to say, a left became champion of the Colosseum at the very beginning of the game. He's had not one, but two heroines in this game. He had a guy try to use some kind of drug to get him to fall in love with him, and now he's out here winning dance contests? People talk about Persona protagonists having swag, but Aleph is really giving them a run for their money here. Where was I? Oh yeah, now that we have all the pillars, we just have to go and place them on those altars around Ropongi. And once six of them have been placed, the last one appears, and we can head on into the Abyss. Now, we're not in the same spot we were last time. We need to get there, but in order to do so, we have to go through this cave that connects to smaller areas where we need to get keys to open the gate forward. At the intersection, we have to fight Hecate, but this can only be done during a new moon. If you try to fight her during any other moon phase, it'll just kick you out. So just wait for the new moon, and then start swinging. 
First turn, I attack with a left, and his attack hits six times for about 100 damage each. She then uses Bufula and freezes Hiroko, but the next turn, I attack again, and this finishes her off. From here, you can take one of four paths, but like I said, before you can move on, you need two keys. So I start with the eastern path. This area is a township with its own armor and weapon shop and everything, so you can heal up and upgrade if you need to. And the boss you have to fight here can only be fought during a full moon. Just go into his chamber during the full moon and... Um... Uh... I mean, I guess he is based on Aleister Crowley. Okay, so with Master Therion, I just go with the usual strategy. Just go for my normal attack, which does the usual 80 to 90-ish damage. But then when Hiroko attacks, her first attack is critical and it does over 400 damage to him. And it also inflicts the happy ailment on him, so he can't move. Come another turn, I attack, get some more lucky criticals, and he still can't move. So then I attack again, and yeah, he's done. That was pretty embarrassing. Alright, so I get the lamed key. That's one key down, and on the western side, the boss I have to fight is Tiamat. Okay, so once again, I go with the same strategy. That is, just attack. Things are a bit different here, though, because Tiamat can inflict ailments. Poison, to be more specific, and you all know what that does. But thankfully, I have Hiroko to cure it when that happens. But she can't do it until after Alef moves. Oh, and when Hiroko does attack, Tiamat becomes happy. Yeah, that's coming in a lot more handy than I thought it would, but yeah, aside from the poison breath and a normal weak attack, Tiamat is not hard to take out and goes down on the first attempt. Alright, I now have the Iron Key. Just put these keys into the door on the northern side, and now we can advance. Once at the central area of the Abyss, I head over to the Northern Temple. But we're greeted by Gremory, who takes us to meet Lucifer in his castle. And there he says his piece. He explains that the Yahweh we killed in the center wasn't the real one. It was a fate created from the twisted doctrines that the angels and the people of the center followed. He also confirms that we're not Satan, God's instrument of judgment and annihilation, and explains that Seth is another half of Satan who God placed at the temple to awaken when Satan would be needed. Something that Lucifer wants us to prevent and then he sends us on our way. If it wasn't obvious, the alignment lock is coming up, and I pretty much decided that I'm going to be taking the law ending here. While I don't necessarily think law is the best ending in SMT2, I do think it's one of the more interesting law endings in the series, and I think it's the most fitting given the themes of this game. It's also heavily implied that it's the canon ending. After Grimory drops us off, we're immediately taken to Eden by Gabriel. Zane explains that he wants to kill Lucifer and rebuild Millennium to establish a true Thousand Year Kingdom. And by saying yes, I have officially locked myself into the Law Path. Now, Zane wants us to go to Seth's temple and awaken him. So we go, and Gremory is there guarding the place, but doesn't try to stop us. And Seth just awakens. Well, that was pretty easy. The only confrontation we run into is on the way out, where we have to fight Asheroth. So, I just attack as usual, but then he inflicts us both with happiness. This stops Hiroko's attack, but for Alef, it immediately wears off. The next turn, I have them both attack again, and Alef attacks, but Hiroko's attack is once again interrupted by her getting shocked by Mazionka. And the next turn, Alef attacks again, and gets two lucky critical hits, and this takes him out. Okay, so we go inside the temple to the north, and all we see is the same empty space that we saw when we looked at Valhalla after it had been swallowed by Abaddon. So, I let it suck me in, and... Oh my god, this is one creepy dungeon. At least it would be, if not for the upbeat, unfitting music. So, we just go through it as usual, and at the end, we run into a familiar face. Madame. I guess even she wasn't spared by the elders, but not far from where she is, we surprisingly find the slum district intact. And what do you know? Mikata is still here. Now that Hiroko is with us, he explains everything. Aleph is an artificially created human, intended to be the Messiah. After building Millennium, the Messiahs needed a savior, but one never came. So they made one, and that's me, along with four others that we named at the beginning of the game. Those guys were also created to help. Beth was meant to be Aleph's partner, Gimel was meant to test the virtual world that would become the Thousand Year Kingdom, and Zane was meant to be Aleph's protector.
However, unlike those guys who were created through cloning, Aleph was created through a real human egg that underwent accelerated aging, and the one who gave birth to Aleph was Hiroko, who is also Mikata's daughter. That is a pretty mind-blowing story, especially for a Super Famicom game, and it also makes that conversation I had in the prison a lot weirder in retrospect. But Mikata was against the whole project, so that's why he erased our memories and then defected. He then gives us the mag presser and then disappears. So we head back into Abaddon's weird cave stomach thing, and I go to where his heart would be. Use the mag presser to materialize it, and now it's to be fought as a boss. So Abaddon definitely looks intimidating, but he's nothing to worry about. I start with the usual attack strategy, and Aleph is doing about 60 while Hiroko is doing about 110. He then goes for Rakukaja, and this cuts our damage by about a quarter, and then he uses this again, and it doesn't seem to have as much of an effect this time. Then he goes for Tetrakarn, after we've all moved, so it's useless, and then another Tetrakarn, and yeah, it's pretty clear to me that he's not going to do anything. So after this, I just auto-battle him to death, and he goes down easily. So now the pathway is open for me to go to the other sections of the abyss, but before I go to where I need to be, first I want to make a brief detour to another optional dungeon with an optional boss that can only be fought in the Law and Chaos paths. But right outside the boss is Beth, who increases all of our stats by one point, which is nice. But anyway, the boss here is Vero Chana. You should all know the drill by now, just attack, 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 and attack some more while stopping to heal when necessary, or use magic when there are no other options. Once again, Aleph is doing damage in the mid-60s range, while Hiroko is doing damage in the low hundreds. This boss is actually doing a good amount of physical damage with his attacks though, over 50 with his normal attack and it can hit multiple times, and his other physical attacks are doing similar amounts total. Although, get this, he gets inflicted with happy early on, so once again he occasionally loses his turns, and yeah, that makes this even easier, and after a few more swings, he gets taken out. And I gain enough levels to max out a left strength. Let's freaking go. So, we're now back on the mandatory path, and this next area in the abyss is a bit ridiculous. The dungeon itself is pretty standard, but it has not one, not two, not three, but 13 bosses. That's right, all the 12 heavenly generals from Buddhism are in this game, and someone from Atlas decided to squeeze them all into this one dungeon. And are they hard? No, they are not. They are some of the easiest bosses in the game. Most of them don't even have a thousand HP and go down in one or two turns from auto battle. At least, that's pretty much the case for all of them except Sandira, who I go into thinking it won't be any different, so I turn on auto battle and then... Whoa, 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 okay, this thing reflects sword attacks, that's going to make things harder. Or will it? Well, you know what it doesn't reflect or block? Light? Yeah, it's actually weak to it. So I have Hiroko cast Mahama and... Yeah, insta-kill. You don't get to insta-kill bosses very often in SMT games, but when you do, it's pretty funny. Anyway, the rest of them go down the same way all the other ones before did, and the boss at the end of the dungeon is Atavaka, who is definitely stronger than the other bosses here. As usual, I go for my normal attacks, while he does his thing, which here is Miragion and his multi-hitting normal attack, both of which are pretty weak. I don't get the happy ailment on him this time, but he still goes down easily all the same after a bunch of hits from a left and Hiroko's normal attacks. So that's another dungeon down, and there's one more dungeon with a mandatory boss before the final one. That is for the law route anyway. It's the Chakma Tower, and it's another small tower of a few easy to navigate floors, and the boss of the dungeon is good old Mara making his long-awaited appearance, and this boss has kind of a weird gimmick. Before the battle starts, Mara tests your intelligence, and if it's not higher than 15, you get paralyzed. Now, I could have used Hiroko to cure a left's paralysis, but I actually misinterpreted how it worked, and I thought it was some kind of unique gimmick where a left just couldn't move at all, so I just solo the battle with Hiroko. 
but a left or not, the strategy is the same. Attack with my normal attack while he attacks, and hope for multiple hits and critical hits. And each attack normally does around 100 damage, while his are doing around 30 to 50. And he seems to go for a left a lot. Things go fine until he uses Shibabu, which binds Hiroko, but this wears off pretty quickly. Close to the end, he gets a lucky multi-hit attack, because his normal attack can hit up to six times, but it doesn't kill either of us, and then Hiroko finishes him off. So, we pass into the next area and get to the doors of the Kether Castle, but they won't let us in because we're not chaos aligned. But now should be a good time to go back and check in on Zane. So we go back to Eden and Zane is expecting us. He says that he realizes who he is. He merges with Seth and... Yep, Zane is Satan. And yes, it is time to confront Lucifer. Zane joins the party, but as a demon. I was kind of hoping it would be a deal where he's a mandatory party member, kind of like Chaos Hero when he went into that demonic form from SMT1, but the game still treats him as a demon with a magnetite cost and everything, so for this reason, we will not be using Zane in battle. But whatever the case, we go back to Kether Castle and Zane forces the doors open. Now, this dungeon is very large and can be confusing, but as long as you have a guide and pay close attention to where you're going, it's actually a pretty short dungeon. But I don't want to go straight to Lucifer, because there is one more optional boss that I want to fight in here. A fan favorite, Beelzebub. Now, once again, going in, I was expecting an easy fight, but man oh man was I in for a surprise. We're at the end of the game, so the difficulty is kind of starting to catch up to me. But even for a normal playthrough, Beelzebub is one tough dude. His attacks aren't strong in terms of damage, but he has a lot of HP and a bunch of his moves inflict ailments, including Paralyze and Panic, and he has Mudoon, so his attack power doesn't even really matter because he has an insta-kill attack. And it means this boss is mostly luck-dependent. I mean, I could have Hiroko spam Tetraja every turn, but he doesn't actually go for Mudoon that often. But it doesn't matter how often he goes for it, because all it takes to end the game is for one of these to hit both of us, and every turn, Hiroko going for Tetraja is a turn she can't attack, which will set me back by 1 to 300 damage each turn. So the best course of action is to just auto battle and hope for the best, and on my successful attempt, that's what I do. Whenever he uses Mudoon, if a character dies, I cancel the auto battle and revive them with either Kintan or a Life Bomb, of which each I have one of. I end up using them both to revive a left twice, but after enough turns of auto battling, I am able to bring down Beelzebub. Alright, there's only one thing left to do now. Take on the big man himself, Lucifer. After a brief dialogue exchange between him and Zane, it is time to fight. And it does not go well. For Aleph's first attack, five out of his six attacks from his sword miss. Lucifer's attacks? Nope, they're pretty accurate, and it can hit up to five times. It doesn't help that my attacks are only doing around 50 damage, while Hiroko's are doing less than 100. Now, most of Lucifer's attacks aren't actually that strong, but there's one major catch. Well, two actually. The first is that he can heal with Diorama. The second, and biggest, is his skill Evil Shine, which charms all foes. You know, that ailment which causes teammates to attack each other? Yeah, that's here, and Lucifer can use it, and that's how I'm taken out on every single one of my failed attempts. Sometimes he uses it early on, sometimes I'm doing good, then he goes for it and it ends the game. No matter what I try, he always manages to bring me down with this move. So what can I do? Well, I try grinding Aleph and Hiroko to level 69, pouring all of their stat bonuses into agility, getting Aleph's maxed out actually. This is actually more to combat Aleph's low hit rate, but this isn't enough, and I still get obliterated by Evil Shine. Things are looking pretty grim, but there is one tactic I'm willing to try. The game doesn't make this very clear, but armor pieces have elemental resistances that apply to you while equipped, and the dolphin helm that you can buy from Shinjuku supposedly reflects mental attacks. I don't know for sure if this will work, but I'm getting desperate here. And while I'm at it, I also buy some more life bombs and angel hairs to cure ailment. So I attempt Lucifer again, and in terms of my attacks hitting and doing damage, not much has changed it seems. 
a left's attacks still miss a frustrating amount of times, but at least his attacks are weak too. A good way into the fight, Lucifer goes for his first evil shine, and it still hits, but for a left, it wears off immediately. It doesn't do that for Hiroko, so I use an angel hair to cure her. I continue the battle, and Hiroko takes an unlucky critical hit and dies. Before I can revive her though, Lucifer goes for Evil Shine again, and it hits a left, but it immediately wears off again. I don't know if this is a sign that the helmet is actually working, or if I'm just getting lucky, but either way, I'm not going to complain. I bring Hiroko back with a Life Bomb, and then continue the battle as normal. He goes for Tentarafu a couple times, and the effects of this also immediately wear off, so I'm starting to think that the helmets actually are working. And then, he goes for Evil Shine a third time, and what do you know, it immediately wears off again on both of us. And yeah, after this, the battle is almost over, and what do you know, I successfully finish off Lucifer. So, we defeat Lucifer, but then Kuzuryu awakens in the underworld and it begins to destroy Millennium. Apparently, this was a failsafe in case Lucifer lost, but Zane launches the Ark into orbit. So, everyone on the Ark and those in Eden are safe. But there's also another function, the Megiddo Ark, a powerful laser weapon meant to destroy all life on Earth. Wait, what? Humanity has committed grave sins with the knowledge Lucifer gave them, they'd repeat their sins. We chose superior humans that understand the truth and are willing to forsake their knowledge for God? Huh? That sounds a lot like what the people at the center would have said. The very people you rebelled against for that exact reason! My god, Zane, what did that transformation do to you? Well, it's too late to turn back now, and like I said, this is why I like this ending. You're led to believe you're doing something better, but when you actually do get the ending, you get this. You don't realize what you've actually gotten into until it's too late, and I think it's very fitting for this game, but yeah, all life on Earth is gone. Now someone wants to speak to us, so we go through this very dark hallway, and it is... God. The real one. He congratulates us, but Zane says he's not done, and in what is a pretty shocking moment, this happens.
Wait, I never said I was on board with this. Ah, whatever. Zane, you know, if you were gonna judge him for genocide, maybe you could have done that before he launched the Megiddo arc. But yeah, even in the law ending, you have to fight Yahweh as the final boss. We are going to be attacking and dethroning God. And if you were expecting me to be able to beat him on my first try, that does not happen. The issue I was having with my attack missing is made even worse here. My attacks miss, I'd say, maybe a good 70% of the time. I mean, come on, I know the Soul Blade has low accuracy, but that's why I maxed out my agility. Now, I do still have Hiriko, but I need to use her for healing and revives because of his Voice of God attack, which insta-kills one target. And that's how he always gets me, by going for this twice in a row. And because he moves before Hiriko, there's nothing I can do. Now, I did miss out on a lot of EXP because in the Law Path, I don't fight any of the godly bosses. So I try grinding up to level 79 and get Hiriko's agility up to 25. And this seems to work, with her moving before Yahweh every time. But that still isn't enough. Aleph is constantly missing and, well, given how much HP this boss has, I try the auto battle strategy that I used against Beelzebub, but it always ends with him going for double voice of God. While Hiroko does move before him, in order to cancel auto battle, I need to hold the B button, not just press it. And I'm not entirely sure if this is the case, but I think he's programmed to go for this attack more when he gets low on HP. So now I have to think about what to do. But before I attempt him again, I want to get a new weapon. But what can I get? I mean, there are no Cathedral of Shadows on this arc, and it's not like I can go back down to Earth for one. But I can still go to the lower floors, and I can still encounter enemies there. And one of those enemies is Kushiel, who drops the Kenan Maru, which is pretty similar to the Soul Blade. It has a higher base power, but it only hits two to seven times. But it's also more accurate, and that's what's important. So, through RNG manipulation, I get the sword, grind one more level, and then go back to attack and dethrone God. Now, I already talked about Yahweh's signature move, Voice of God, but aside from that, he doesn't have much. He has both Dekaja and Dekunda, which don't matter to me since I can't use buffs or debuffs, and Megiddo and Megidolon, both of which hardly put a scratch on the party. The only move that's kinda strong is his normal attack, which still doesn't do that much. The strategy is pretty much the same as it was before, and with a left stew weapon, things are going much better. Not only is he taking more damage, around 50 to 60, but his attacks are actually hitting, and they're hitting more often than I thought they would, while Hiroko is still doing a little under 100 damage with her attacks. But yeah, given how high his defenses are and how much HP he has, I just do the auto battle strat again, and during this, I wail on him while he idiotically goes for Dekaja and Dekunda most of the time while occasionally going for his magic attacks and his normal attack. In my final attempt, it's a little while before he goes for Voice of God, so when that happens, I bring a left back and start auto-battling again. Once this happens a second time, I revive and heal as usual. But now, I'm going to be playing more carefully. I won't be turning on auto-battle because I need to be able to revive a left or Hiroko when they go down before he can take out the other one. And this was the right move. It's not long before he goes for Voice of God again on Aleph, so I just bring him back and... Yeah, even though there's no auto battle, the strategy is the same. Just keep attacking while only stopping to heal. A little further in, I get the two Voices of God in a row. Immediately after I revive Aleph, he goes for it again and takes him out again. But thankfully, as long as one of us is standing, the game isn't over. So I keep fighting and a few turns later, he goes for it again. He only seems to do it on a left for some reason, but a few turns later, and he does it again. At this point, I don't even bother healing a left unless his HP gets really low, because he's just going to kill him by the time he's healed. But this doesn't matter, because after this, it's only a few more turns before God is defeated.
And that is it. As Gabriel put it, everything is done. Hiroko and I head back to Eden where Zane disappears, and yeah, looks like we're going to be building the new world. Talk about a depressing ending. So we get a little montage of all the events of this game in reverse order, and then the credits roll. So yeah, there you have it everyone. It is possible to beat Shin Megami Tensei without demons. I'm definitely planning to make more videos on these old school SMT games since you all seem to like them. SMT if is definitely on my list, but hopefully the next video will be Persona 3 Reload. Be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe if you like the video, and until the next video, I will see you all later.